Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. It is uh, Friday morning, 7:30 a.m. India time, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and 6 p.m. Pacific Time. This is an um, not the usual time that we usually go live, but uh, Sridharji and I thought it was important to discuss about what a central bank's role is when a certain bank seems to run into financial difficulties. This is going to be our topic today. We learn a lot about banking from a technologist turned banker turned venture capitalist, Sridhar Sityalaji. Sridharji, Namaskar and welcome to Pay Guru's channel. Namaskaram, good morning, good evening to everybody uh, in the United States and good, very good morning, uh, warm morning to you all uh, in, in, in India. If you're watching from India and then afternoon in Australia, it's about 1 p.m. there. So, sir, I just want to set the context here. Over the last few months, maybe even the last few years, we are seeing a rash of amalgamations happening in India. The State Bank of India, uh, you know, a lot of state banks and other banks merged with State Bank of India and, and Punjab National Bank also got a few and so on and so forth. So from about uh, two digit numbers of public sector banks. Now it is on the lower two digits, perhaps even a single digit number of public sector banks in India. And this nobody has really explained why these things were brought about, except that when somebody is pressed, they usually give like, oh, we want to make these banks stronger, meaning the merging banks stronger, uh, whatever that means. Um, so uh, in this context, there is the central bank, the regular, uh, the Reserve Bank of India in uh, India or the Federal Reserve in United States. They are tasked with a very important role that is to regulate and they also have to sign off on all these mergers, acquisitions, what have you. Now, you were in the ringside seat when the 2008 financial crisis happened in the United States. Now, why don't you kind of set the context for maybe one or two acquisitions that happened during that time, sir, so that our users can get an idea of the role a regulator, that is the Federal Reserve Bank, pays, plays and, and how they bring about somewhere shotgun marriages, somewhere marriages where both partners were willing. So maybe you can kind of set the context there and then we will start applying that to the Indian scenario. Great, great, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think you probably hit the nail on the head. I was with uh, Wachovia in 2008. I just, just joined uh, Wachovia in 2000, uh, late 2007 from Citibank. Um, and, you know, we, we were tasked at that point of time to uh, mobilize uh, deposits and to stabilize the balance sheet uh, of uh, Wachovia, which had at that point of time acquired uh, a big mortgage lender called Golden West. Anyway, so I was there when the 2008 financial crisis hit, and the 2008 financial crisis created enough market turbulence, uh, and in the process created a lot of stability around the uh, around the um, the orchestration and the organization of many banks. Uh, usually, there are two types of models. One model is when you have disproportionate growth in distressed assets. That means it's the loan side of the book when that begins to go south um, and they are the prime generators of revenue to offset the expenses which is on the as the, the liability side which is deposits that you take from the people so the banks play a role in in ensuring that there is stable loans stable revenue streams and the margins that you create turns into profits which is distributed as dividends. In the case of Wachovia, where I was, we had run on our bank, which means there was more deposits leaving the bank. And, and why was that, sir? Well, when you have financial turbulence, banks, people panic, which is to say, will this bank be alive? Will my deposit be available? You should hear this story even in India, which is to say, Reserve Bank of India is regulating the withdrawals is containing the withdrawals. You can only come to your branch. You don't need, you can't draw from an ATM. If you come to your branch, we only will give you 50,000 rupees per week, something like that, some number, which is, you know, um, arbitrary number that I'm throwing up here. So all that means is they are controlling the liquidity, basically to make sure that the bank stays liquid. And it stays liquid by virtue of two things. One, it has got its own capital, 
or its transactional flows allows it to borrow from other banks um, and meet its obligations, um, its uh, systemic obligations in terms of what it owes to the other banks. So in the case of Wachovia, uh, you know, we had a turbulence created by the deposit, um, uh, the flight of deposits, which in turn created uh, an imbalance. Getting back to the fundamental question that you asked, what is the role of the central banks? The role of the central banks is the first and foremost maintain systemic risk, which is namely that the financial system which flows through the banks is seamless and it is performing optimally. The second, its role is to con constantly monitor and manage the endemic risk that is prevalent within the banks, within the banking system. So in other words, there's enough capital, there's enough liquidity, there's provisions for risk that can arise as a result of things not happening. It is very simple. If you have borrowed $10, $10 and if you have $100 of uh, assets, when your $10 uh, goes bad. That means the person who is owes you ten dollars is unable to give. You still have ninety dollars to run your life. But if you have only ten dollars, then when your ten dollars goes, that means you don't have a ten dollars. Effectively, it's equal to kind of a zero uh, because the reason is you have borrowed somebody ten dollars using your ten dollars as asset. So it basically gets wiped out. So your Reserve Bank monitors to to monitors and manages the risk and the risk stability and whether there's enough capital that is prov provisioned against the risk. So besides these things, it also looks at mergers, it looks at subsidiaries, it looks at expansion programs, it looks at uh, its thrift licenses, it looks at its expansion. So it covers a wide range of functions ranging from capital, liquidity, risk management, and all the prudential requirements that a bank needs to manage in a normal sense. That is one of the primary functions of a central bank. The second set of functions is what I call as the, the supervisory functions, where it goes and manages and monitors uh, how the business is conducting its operations and it, whether there are any potential risks that is created by virtue of operations that it is engaged in. So in other words, if it has got a specific provisions for being in securities business or lending business or in any of those activities, or they're following the norms or their governance and operational procedures is contravenous to the established procedures, then they must report it and then have remedial measures in place and make sure that the remedial measures uh, are monitored again. You know, it's the second set of functions that it does. Then the third, which we are seeing, yes. Um, sir, finish your third point and then I'll ask you the question. Sorry about that. Third, the third point is what I wanted to say is you saw just right now the stimulus, right? When the central banks say there is a fundamental risk to because small businesses and corporates borrow from the banking system. When you have a pandemic type of a situation or when you have a financial crisis type of a situation, when their business is not normal, it is typically the governments or the private enterprises which provide liquidity. And that actually flows in some way through Fed into the system, into the banks. So Treasury gives $500 billion. The $500 billion is injected through Fed into the respective banks and monitored. So the loans were distributed as what you call pardonable loans or, you know, uh, or loans which will be uh, managed and monitored through the bank process um, and the, the, the central banks make sure that it is it is uh, in compliance with the norms that uh, the loans are uh, in turn distributed by the banks. So it performs this systemic task in terms of providing what we call liquidity. They use the word backstopping the credit and providing the liquidity to the participants in the economic system. Sir, uh, my question to you was, um, you said that the central bank sort of monitors the performance of all these banks. So they must be having a couple of parameters that can, can quantifiably measure. Uh, I'm talking about things like uh, the cash reserve ratio or the strat statutory lending requirements, I think, SLR. 
Yes. Uh, um, so these numbers uh, have to be within a certain range, isn't it? And if that hap if it doesn't happen, then that should uh, flag a red flag in in the Reserve Bank or the central banks, isn't it? Yes, I think the what you call is the cash reserve ratio, which is the amount of cash available relative to its deposits or assets. Statutory liquidity ratio, which is you know the minimum you know ten percent of your deposit should be available. Uh, ten percent of your capital should be available. Right? So so you have a statutory liquidity ratio uh, norm that's also uh, prevalent. Uh, then you are looking at um, what you call risk provisions. You know, typically, if you have, you should not cross a specific band um, of risk. Uh, in, for example, in the uh, mortgage industry, the risk band is between one and three percent. That is, one and five percent. In in the financial crisis, the risk band crossed ten percent. Okay, in the credit cards business or the lending business, uh, auto is different. In the credit card, the typically is around six percent. And typically, when they, when they begin to cross 10, 12 percent, or even 14 percent, in the financial crisis, the um, um, the loan loss ratios were somewhere north of 20 percent. So, which means that if you have a trillion dollars loan, you have close to 200 billion dollars. That was the 1.1 trillion dollars was the credit card total loans um, dispersed during the peak of the financial crisis, right? And the market shrank by almost 35, 40% went down to 600 billion because close to 20% of that lo of those loans were written off, were you know, bad, bad loans, loans which were not going to be repaid. But take the auto loans, you know, you got to, so each of these segments have very specific ratios and thresholds, which also re depends on the payment rates, you know, how much is, uh, what is the minimum payment needs to be made for it to kind of remain uh, sustainable. And then for the uh, for the um, uh, banks in the securities industry, uh, you are talking about leverage. Many of them do leverage because they don't have deposits. Uh, they take loans and uh, from other institutions. Uh, a typical uh, what we call leverages are around between six eight percent. That's the norm. And at the peak, the 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 leverages in uh, the in the uh, securities uh, industry or the what we call as the uh, the big commercial, big uh, non-commercial banks, wholesale banks. Uh, it was around uh, 10 to 12 percent. In in some instances, was even 23 percent. Um, you know, these are banks like uh, Lehman Brothers, uh, Bear Stearns, uh, etc. So they all faced uh, significant. Everything is okay when, as long as you are meeting your uh, prudential obligations to the other banks. When you sell a security, you have liquidity, you pay off. When you buy a security, you have liquidity to pay. But when you owe more than what you have, and especially if you owe $10 on a leverage of 23, and you have only $1, because leverage means you have one, and you have taken 23, and you owe 10, there's no mechanism by which you can make up that nine, because you don't have an asset that can give you that bridge of 22, leave alone the 10. So these and, are- and and when times go tough, even the nine, even if something that's worth nine will be only worth four <laughs> well, because of know, distress. <laughs> yeah, you'll be lucky if it is worth four rather than less than one. Okay, <laughs> in most instances, it happens to be it'll be happen to be less than one. So you will be probably rotating the same. So it's so these are things that the the central banks monitor from a fiduciary and compliance and risk management point of view. They should not catch this when the event has overblown. They should expect a tsunami like this and be in preparation. So 2008 type crisis, you know, may not happen every other year, but it happens every 30, 40 years. And when it does, then, you know, usually these, the, the central banks are what we call as the, the monetary tools uh, and prudential tools to manage it. So uh, let's just, uh, I want to kind of just take one more step and look at the American system and then cast our views on uh, the India's uh, banking. So uh, th in 2008, some excesses were committed. There were instruments that were, you know, you know, let's just say, let's say the better collateral debt obligations really literally broke the, uh, the back of the camel, the last straw that broke the camel's back. And then when um, you know Chris Dodd and Barney Frank 
passed a law, they tighten the regulations for all the banks across the board, isn't it? So when they say they tighten the rules for the banks and uh, operations, what did they tighten? Just, you know, big, big picture, sir. Like, did they increase the CRR or SLR? Did they just make them more no, stringent? I, what exactly I, did they do? They increased the lending standards. Those mm. uh, st statutes don't go away. Mm. Is what else is the tier one capital, tier two capital, the amount of capital that you hold uh, from a financial risk point of view, you know, used to be 8%. Now they've increased mm. it to about 14%. Okay, tier one, tier two, most of the case. So it's what is called as the uh, stress testing that was done. Right. Uh, uh, so tier one capital basically implies the amount of capital that you have left for a rainy day. Okay, that's the tier one capital. Tier two is the flexibility where you leave capital and then you can you can use it as appropriate, but then you still keep excess uh, into the tier two. So that you have tier one is mandatory. That's regulated. Okay. Uh, so the uh, and Basel three uh, rules, but you know, even tightened it further in terms of uh, what's a rule. For example, if I give you thousand dollars loan, and I have only you have only taken six hundred dollars loan, and you have not used four hundred. Typically, the banks provision for six hundred dollars, not for the all of the thousand dollars. But when you actually look at the book, the banks have a contingent obligations to basically. Whenever you ask for $1,000, that is the balance 400 you needed to give. So this financial crisis suddenly, you know, when the crisis extended to the credit markets, both on the, uh, then they found, oh my God, you have un unused limits. If somebody comes in and says, I, I need to give more, I need to draw down on this limit, then what am I going to do? Because the reason is I don't have the capacity, though I have contingent obligations to make this available. So we went through a whole exercise of shrinking, which is called as, you know, we change your limit. You have only now no more. $1,000, you have used 600 you can only take $25 more. Or for you, no more. You have to pay back another $100. We have reduced your limit to $500. Banks can do that under extraneous circumstances as that was the case. So this, what you call as loans granted, but loans not availed, were not provisioned in the 2008 crisis. So for that's one example of what the regulatory change, uh, that's not regulatory change mandated, but that is bank supervision, supervision, which is if you don't have enough capital to provision for any future losses that arises, then you should not be. This is what the supervisory work of the central banks is when it monitors and studies the institutions. So this is not SLR or CRR. This is the operational risk as well as the credit risk that arises from uh, what the bank is doing with the balance sheet in terms of conducting its operations, right? So that's the that's a, that's a Fed responsibility or a fiduciary kind of responsibility. The reason why I point, point, the point this out uh, is that Bonnie Frank and other things, which is namely said, at that point of time in mortgage business, you can take 105%. I mean, since you come from California, California was the epicenter of the mortgage crisis, right? Properties were being bought and sold like nobody's business. And if your property was worth $100, you know, you can get a, you can get a, you know, prime loan of 80, you can get a home equity of, uh, against that of 10 to 15%. Then you can take a personal loan, then you'll get a credit card loan so that you have, you know, you can, you have a fully furnished house, uh, you know, available without paying a dollar. Now that is violation of the norm. So that's why they tightened the credit conditions and they said the banks needed to be far more. If you take what we call as the non-US Anglo-Saxon countries like UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, and so on, there was always a rule that when you are buying a mortgage, you should come with a 20 to 25 percent. Australia went the opposite way. They said you got to have 30 percent um, of the capital provided before we can give you. And by the way, they will cut 10 to 15 percent of the the purchase price, and on that you have to provide. So they went the other extreme, which is namely to say uh, to avoid. So some of the Bonnie Frank rules. Um, address some of these issues around both corporate side, the commercial side, as well as on the uh, on the retail side of the business, because the risks <clears throat> cascaded in all three. For example, you cannot have, um, you know, even if you have five billion dollars of 
uh, capital or 25 billion dollars of capital you are still your leverage should be within a measurable like five six or seven you know like that the norms were introduced okay and mr volker you know who is a well-known central banker uh, was actively involved in some of these resolution proprietary trading is not allowed okay you can't trade on your books when you trade on your uh, liquidity of your uh, of your clients make sure they are made aware this is the term that use collateral debt obligations a lot of these loans were sold to these fellows who didn't understand a word about you know what the hell they were but they bought all this so these are some of the issues that were addressed which were missed out or which were not within the kind of the purview of the uh, uh the central banks uh but you know um uh, uh, so central banks have a wide range of supervisory monitoring in fact as well as in the case of you know i can take the case of vacovia itself in the vacovia itself when post gold invest acquisition when we had 10 billion dollars of booked kind of potential losses which is minuscule on a 125 billion dollar you know asset base uh, is is very small relatively small so therefore they prescribe certain norms which is increase your capital make sure that you have enough liquidity in the system you have enough risk provisioning and then there is a strategic plan which says how you allocate capital across your three vast number of businesses and make sure that your earnings reflect and your balance sheet and the provision of conduct reflects these principles that was laid out um uh, and federal reserve of richmond uh, oversaw this particular process and took accountability and the recapitalization was happening uh, and the strategic plan was being uh, orchestrated and 8 billion new capital was sourced via deposits commercial and individual and the balance sheet under the supervision of a central bank before the financial crisis came what i'm saying here is that the central bank fed can get so deep into the rudimentary principles of at a high level operation sir thank you for that sir now i just want us to go start taking a look at the indian banking system uh viewers those of you uh who want to kind of understand a little bit about india's banking you need to uh, look at the history of state bank of india that's where a lot of things started that was one of the first banks to be formed it was actually formed by grouping three banks that used to sort of parallelly function independently in mumbai in those days erstwhile bombay madras and calcutta and and they were uh, i think they were grouped together to form what is called as the imperial bank and the imperial bank's first indian chairman was sri uh, aragappa chettiar if i remember correctly uh, annamalai chettiar i'm sorry annamalai chettiar um and and he was the one who was one of the founders of indian bank he also founded in you know he used to be also he got the pattam raja also very you know eminent personality but i think that just wanted to kind of put that point there that's where the genesis of india's banks is although indian bank was the first indian run bank that was ever started in india 1906 it rose from the ashes of a failed british bank called arbathnot bank i have written all this in various stories so viewers who follow p guru stories will know all that the reason i'm saying all this is the reserve bank of india has been doing a fairly good job up until maybe 25 years ago or somewhere in that place where things kind of started going a little loose here a little loose there i'll give you one example sir i wrote this article i'm going to show you this on um march 3rd 2018 wow banking scam has upa era roots so this is the nirav modi scam mm. uh, and i analyzed what had gone wrong in the punjab national bank branch of mumbai and and if you look at the picture there see it tells you anybody who understands bank there is something called as a core banking system and the core banking system is supposed to be the one that can tell uh, whether punjab national bank has enough money in terms of foreign exchange to honor anybody's letter of undertaking or lc or uh, any other instrument like that and and it so happened 
<laughs> in this case, they bypassed the core banking system completely. And, and, and that's what led to it. And the other interesting thing that came about was the question that everybody asked, hey, if PNB is doing this, a particular branch is doing this, what was RBI doing? They were supposed to go and look at the books every year. What were they doing? And it turns out that RBI never looked at that particular bank's uh, books. So it's a, it's a real, very, very funny way it, it played out. I'm just curious. So today's point is that RBI also has a lot of things to fix. It, did, it didn't matter whether the, uh, the RBI governor was somebody from Chicago's uh, university, University of Chicago, or a banker, or now a babu. It seems like a lot of these old habits are continuing. And, and I just want to kind of now come to the question, yes, bank failed. And they put limits on how much people could withdraw from there. Yes Bank was made good by loans from State Bank of India and so on and so forth. Whereas when Lakshmi Vilas Bank has failed, now we have a bank outside of India, the DBS. Suddenly they seem to have acquired it. So what metrics do you think the RBI applied when they had these two different cases? And what does it mean for the shareholders of these two banks, Yes Bank and uh, Lakshmi Vilas Bank? Well, I think the um, uh, superficially people uh, can look at issues um, and come to conclusions which don't seem logical prima facie to many. Now, why the treatment of one is different to the other? Um, you know, what brief I knew, know about Lakshmi Vilas Bank or LVB as it's called, it looks like see, these efforts have been going on to find uh, a suitor for uh, LVB for almost 12 months. You know, uh, it's, conce it's conceivable that the state banking system, whether it is political or whether it is economical, were consolidated probably because of to some substratum set of uh, systems and procedures, uh, which are harmonious. So from an integration point of view, uh, makes it far more seamless. I'm giving you a superficial view, right? because I've seen a lot of people from state bank go to any of these kind of state bank subsidiaries. So it's possible. It's also probably a political move. Um, and um, with the underlying financial principles. Uh, but in the case of Lakshmi Vilas Bank, what I, what I can gather, I can relate to my own kind of Wachovia Bank or some banks here, right? Well, Wachovia Bank. So the story is that it seems like they didn't. Seems like people who came in uh, were not satisfied uh, and or they were not prepared to make a decision. And in the meanwhile, uh, the loan book was going south and south and south, which means that um, it has uh, it has very less revenue making ability while its costs were going up. When then when that generally happens, you have systemic issues because banks operate in what you call as a payment system. When they operate in a payment system, you know, my corporations and individuals, you know, uh, issue checks, take money, put deposits. So there is a problem uh, that is created on the liquidity side, especially if there is not enough revenue flowing in by virtue of impaired assets. Impaired assets creates two problems. Whatever capital that is available, they have to make a provision for risk. It's called as the risk provisioning because you have a, a kind of a growing, then that part of the asset is not available. Why did the banks, there's no, at that point of time, now there is a bankruptcy law. Previously, there was no bankruptcy law. So they didn't even charge off many of the loans. They did not issue procedures, liquidation procedures, <laughs> to liquidate the assets and to some Excuse extent me. take haircuts in their balance sheet and say, my loan is $10. I can only recover $3. Basically, $7 is written off. Governments can kind of back what you call back end those losses by putting capital. This is a very common epidemic in India where government seems to have put in lots and lots and lots of capital uh, to stabilize the balance sheets of the uh, of the banks. OK, people with a lot of Indian expertise can comment on that rather than myself. But I've heard and read that there's enough liquidity that has been put to restabilize the balance sheets. So to coming back to your uh, question, this particular institution, um, you know, they may not have 
uh, found a suitor. Some suitor came in, which is Lakshmi Vilas, and always. Oh, you mean DBS? Oh, sorry, DBS. Uh, the um, usually the banks choose what we call a less expensive route, which means they don't need to babysit. They don't need to backstop the credit. They don't need to go and you know spend money from their balance sheet for any kind of systemic risk in the event some. Their, their secondary lenders are not able to provide capital to manage its obligations on the settlement side. All these things are a cost to them. So they say, which is the bank which can provide the deposit base and a balance sheet to stabilize? It came DBS India operations. It's not DBS Singapore. It's the DBS Indian operations, which is Indian listed. That particular institution came and said, okay, I'll raise the hand. Now, maybe, you know, the Babu or whosoever said, hey, this looks good to me, you know, and let me kind of cut and get rid of this big problem that I have. Otherwise, this problem is going to surface. So because it's also conceivable that the supervisory failures were supervised, super, supervision was inadequate. I'm not saying it is, but it could have been. So many times, many a times you find that there is laxity in the supervision, which causes this abnormal spurge. Uh, in the in the bad loans, right? So they made a decision in the case of um, uh, in the case of uh, Lakshmi Vilas Bank. I don't know about the geographic footprint, the business expansion opportunity. I think Yes Bank, at least I, I am uh, I'm, I'm told that you know it's got prime operations in Bombay and it's got prime operations in Punjab or wherever the uh, the footprint is. So it has got a commercial footprint market expansion capability, which is one of the reasons why banks like State Bank of India looked at and came in and said, okay, now we're going to, it's a badly managed bank, but the underlying franchise is very good. Is most of my depositors going to leave? That's one question that will come up. When I put this under a system, is the depositors and the business going to stay or is it going to leave? If it's going to leave, it's better for you to liquidate that bank and get rid of it and get done with only when there is an expansion possibility by virtue of the footprint that the business, the banking is in. That's when capital infusion or a merger occurs, right? I can give one example. In the case of Vakovia, you know, we needed, uh, we needed, when the flight of deposits happened, we needed to merge with a bank which had deposits so that they can backstop and, and, and then balance the, the asset liability ledger, right? Citibank had tremendous deposits, right? So which we can leverage. Combined deposits would have been close to $800 billion. Wells Fargo is a, at that point of time, a strong financial institution um, and, you know, very good risk management principles. So both banks were offered the opportunity because it would have been less expensive to FDIC, which is the Depository Insurance uh, Corporation, and to the uh, and to the Fed, and they chose to give it to Citibank because Wells Fargo wanted some assistance from the central bank, which is to say, this part of the loan book is good, this part of the loan book is bad, this part of the loan book I'll take care. If something goes bad here, you have to write, um, give me the capital, um, you know, and basically make sure backstop it rather than bleed from our balance sheet. If that's the case, we'll take over this bank. Reserve Bank, uh, Fed and FDIC said, no, 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 that's not what we want to do. We want to give, get rid of it and to somebody. Citibank said, I'm ready, so I'll take it. So they took it. But in the meanwhile, they went back and said, they came back and said, they'll take over. So in the case of why I'm trying to point out this is, I don't know the nuances of the Yes Bank and LVB, but I can compare similar circumstances and said, Okay, as far as the S Bank is concerned, two or three of us can come together, inject capital as an equity rather than, and then we can re uh, recapitalize and allow it to uh, be integrated. So they chose that path. State banks, they said, you know, we can consolidate, we can get rid of some of the branches because we sit to, against each other. Our lending and deposit and other procedures are similar. And the government knows, and good chunk of business is government, so we kind of amalgamate these banks. This happened in Japan. Japan merged the two, two big banks, which had adjacent kind of business streams, to create the four largest banks in Japan. 
In the case of Lakshmi Vilas Bank, it probably is, I don't know, it's probably, its footprint is somewhere, you know, distant, and only the a strategic suitor uh, was willing to come in and put capital and take over. If this bank was so popular, it wouldn't have waited for 12 months for a suitor to be found, right? Because banks are looking for inorganic growth and back are looking for expansion. So my view is that that could have been the decision making process. But what happens? The optics and execution in most instances is less transparent. So then it opens room for a number of questions why bondholders were consult not consulted, why they were not given an opportunity to put capital, why promoters were not consulted, why when before you consummated the sale, the promoters were not given enough time for the right of refusal, right of veto. Did you kind of go bypass and, you know, override yourself? These are questions that come up, you know, which Mr. Dr. Subramanya Swami has raised, which is to say, in at least in the case of Lakmila's, why you didn't do all these things? You should do a forensic audit of all this kind of stuff. Whether there was supervision failure, whether there was board failure, whether the promoters were contacted. So there's a process issue, and then there is a compliance issue, right? So to me, to answer your question in a long-winded way, that though it is, from an optics point of view, it looks like you know, procedural kind of issues were violated and the discretion in exercising the choices look wide apart. But this is often the case which happens in the backdoor negotiations between a central bank and the suitor. Of course, the guy who is going down, the affected institution has very little say because there's very little credibility. I think lots of people were fired in that bank as well. I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't have a historical view. Generally, you will find that quite a few members of the leadership will be fired because you can't have the same guys who are managing the book badly to be continuing to running down the bank. So um, for, the, um, for the deposit holder, for the person who holds an account in banks like LVB, the last thing they heard from RBI was that they could not withdraw more than 25,000 rupees from their accounts. Now, in India, the equivalent of the $250,000 per account ceiling that FDIC provides to every, uh, you know, uh, every customer, every customer of a bank in the U.S., the equivalent in India is 1 lakh rupees. But there is a big distinction, sir. If I have four bank accounts in the same branch, let's say I have four accounts in Wells Fargo, each one is guaranteed up to $250,000. So I could sort of spread my risk as my deposits increase to try and keep opening new bank accounts and keep putting money there. That is an option. It is not available in India. You can have any number of bank accounts. The, the net total is only 100,000 rupees. So that is a very stringent requirement. Now, if a uh, somebody needs money in a hurry, go ahead. United States, sir, it's per bank per account 250,000. You can't have four accounts in United States in JP Morgan and each account is not 250. They try to kind of, at a customer level, in a deposit, they restrict it to about $250,000. But you could have an account in Wells Fargo, you can have an account in Bank of America, you can have an account in each of those accounts because it is at a customer level beyond a deposit. Um, I, I, I don't know, sir. I, I remember uh, reading about this, but anyway, I could be wrong. It's okay. Uh, in India, it is one lakh, and now the amount that anyone can withdraw from these accounts in Lashmi Vilas Bank is 25,000 rupees. If, if a new company, if a new bank comes in and acquires the assets, and now essentially it is DBS India that is operating, all the signs will change from LVB to DBS India. At what point will the new bank lift these restrictions? I'm just asking you a the hypothetical question. Well, I think that the when, one the the uh, the, uh, um, the restrictions are usually lifted when there is liquidity found, because there's no liquidity. They're looking at the liquidity and saying this money will meet the. Uh, the settlement obligations of this bank based on the velocity of flows of money 
for a period of time. So therefore, you know, they may even reduce it to from 25 to 10, or they may increase it to 75,000 rupees, depending on the liquidity. If more depositors come and open deposit, so there's enough liquidity to, to kind of float it around, because all people are not going to call for a deposit uh, withdrawal time. If there is, then there is the, uh, you have the uh, cash reserve ratios to kind of, uh, uh, statutory liquidity ratios and cash reserve ratios to take care of uh, the balance sheet and needs of the institution. So the story is that when will they live when you have more harmony in the uh, the balance sheet on the liquidity and on their capital base and can, how can liquidity come liquidity comes when you have more trading when you have more uh, business generated by the bank and more income flowing through and income flows through only two ways one is fees and the other is the spread that happens on the what we call as the net interest margins right between your deposit rate and your lending rate so that's when these things happen one other way by which this happens is when the central bank decides to intervene through a government backed program to infuse capital so that's the other way that uh, you find you provide liquidity to that institution um, but in the United States, they don't take at an institution to institution level. I don't know about India, but some of the emerging economies where you can say, OK, bank A, we are going to make some provisions. Bank B, we're going to make some provisions and provide liquidity. Sir. So I think that there is that aspect of, um, um, of, 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 of the business, which is what makes the banks to have these ceilings on withdrawal rates to be lifted. Well, uh, that's uh, an excellent uh, look at how banks are supposed to function. But moving forward, sir, um, RBI, I know for sure, has been not up to the mark in terms of regulating because I told you about the example of PNB. And, and you know, these kinds of things is not an instance of a single cockroach. I'm sure there were many other instances. However, like everything else in India, things stay in the news in the limelight for a few days and then the new cycle changes to something else and this is forgotten. In terms of what, uh, like for example, Dot Frank came in and fixed a few things for uh, American banks and now the American banks having become better, now going are going back and saying, please relax these things because of this, 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 whatever it is. So where do you see uh, the... Um, uh, what do you see for RBI? If you were to suddenly were to advise the RBI board, what would you say to them how to fix some of these problems? Got it. It's a great question. Uh, before we go in, uh, more regulation and more less governance will not solve the problem. Okay. So in most of the issues, we complain as bankers, you regulate us to death. We can't transact business. Way we need to be held accountable is is the governance process and our internal systems and controls. So central banks have to spend more time studying the adequacy of systems and controls in that is put in place and the risk metrics and the risk measures, both on the operational credit and counterparty and country, you know. Am I doing more business with Nigeria when I should not should not be? Am I doing more business with Enron when I should not be? Am I doing more business disproportionate on the lending side when I should not be? When I do any of these businesses, how do I check every day my operations are stable, not harmful, and not creating an inherent system risk? To the stability of the financial system. So in other words, this is what you, the reserve banks needs to be, the central banks, not reserve banks, central banks need to be testing. So if I'm kind of, uh, you know, looking at, which is to say, I'll be looking at the, the systems, stability, the audit, the NPA process, you know, that is, uh, that is in place. Plus, as well as, you know, you mentioned about um, the, you mentioned about uh, a very specific instance of Nirav Modi and a specific branch where activities were happening which were not tracked and recorded, which allowed the loan book to kind of bulge. So somebody should have said, 
you know, from a systemic point of view, a Punjab National Bank seems to have the same instrument which is uh, used for drawing down with Bank A, Bank B, Bank C, Bank D. Something is wrong. So that is a failure not only on the governance side, there's a governance failure, but it's also on the fiduciary side, which is to say why there is a volatile set of activities on one side. It's like this. There's only one instrument, one million, but that same instrument has traded, traded 10 million times, right? So there's a problem. That should have been tracked either internally by the bank or by an external regulator. In most instances, you will find that there is not such a level of banking rigor that exists within the supervisory officers who sit in a central bank. That's where things go wrong. Well, um, thanks for that uh, journey down the memory lane for what happened in 2008 and at least United States appears to have fixed its malaise. To a large extent, the banks are healthy today. They are all pro posting profits. Even during COVID, they are posting profits. Maybe some of it is paper uh, profits because, you know, they got a uh, huge uh, a chunk of stimulus money also. But in, the, in India, I am assuming that this is just the beginning and that there may be other banks also which might be coming out. I think my from what I hear you, sir, the RBI needs to really, really put its thinking cap on and, and try and find out and, and the, you, you, they need to do a smell test to find out what other bank is not doing well. And uh, I think uh, this, this could be a huge strain on the already, uh, you know, COVID strained government of Narendra Modi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I would uh, see operational supervision an operational audit from a from a regulatory point of view has to be very stringent. We got out of the 2008 to 2010 crisis because very stringent operational uh, rules were put. The where we failed was, as you picked up an instrument, nobody could understand these complex instruments which were written on the funding side of the balance sheet. Right? You have mortgages on one side. Right? You have to have funds to support those mortgages. So people did not raise deposits. People went in because our industry is securitized. So you can actually go and sell these loans. So somebody, they went and wrote this, what they call, you know, layers of risk-based product systems and said, hey, you can make 13% return on this because I have packed, you know, 4%. 10%, 8% risk price loans. When I combine this, it is equal to 13%. So you get, so people put money into that, right, into that 13%. Now you are guaranteed to offer 13%. Whether actually you are generating 13% or not, none of these guys who wrote those products had any ability to quantify that. They had no idea, okay? Then you come to the system, then you come to the, uh, the supervisory side. The supervisory institutions must be able to get at that kind of level and say, we have a problem here because the, the funding side is again another institution which has given it to another set of customers. Those guys are going to go burst when they find that these products have both capital risk as well as the guaranteed, uh, what you call um, uh, the coupon, the interest risk, right? And that's what led to the, the complete collapse on both sides of the ledger. Now, if the regulatory institutions are not capable of assessing that you are doomed. And that's where you find most, it's not more regulation. It is a, your ability, as you rightly said, your ability to quantify the procedure and process and basically say, this product should not be in the market. It should not be sold. This should not be the source of funding for writing more mortgages. This is not sustainable, right? So that is what, uh, uh, the, the regulatory institutions must be doing, but not hitting with more regulation. You have but more regulations, you're basically paying a fee, but not doing any business. A lot of food for uh, thought here, uh, Sridhar ji. And um, this is something that I think uh, the government needs to take a serious look at. Uh, what we have tried to shine the spotlight on is to show that uh, there are some serious issues and as COVID continues to ravage 
and rage around the world, we don't know when that's going to end. But some of these things need a look like immediately, like now. So uh, I hope that, uh, you know, we see some clarity. And in, in by the same flip of coin, I think that the American banks are probably well positioned to ride this COVID wave. If you can just answer that question, sir, and then we can call an end to this hangout. I think the stability tests have been conducted across all financial institutions. Uh, the $2.2 trillion of capital that was infused into the banking system to make sure that the companies are able to operate across all three sectors, which is namely mid-corporates, corporates to small enterprises, has given the businesses to transact uh, without any significant impairment on the balance sheet. The fact that the markets are up is pretty good. The fact that the banking stocks have some, to some extent taken a hit is because they are not able to generate more earnings with 0% interest rates. Only when interest rates climb, banks make kind of more money. That's why people who are in trading, that is, who generate fee-based revenue, like Goldman and JP Morgan, you know, have done exceptionally kind of well in those markets. But this liquidity in the hands of the people that has been given through the PPP as well as the unemployment insurance and so on to all the taxpayers has benefited in terms of people not defaulting on their credit cards, not defaulting on their auto loans and not defaulting on their mortgage payments. Right. You have not seen any kind of what we call as the credit losses peak up in the mortgage business. We have not seen that. Right. That simply means that people you can see in at one dollar, people were using 30 cents or 35 cents in the dollar in paying down the debt out of the money that they got by way of the Austrian. Then they spent about 30 to 35 cents. That's why the spend on retail has continued to kind of climb. It shifted from in footprint to online, but the retail price, retail sales have continued to go. And then they also prudently put some money in savings. The savings, personal savings went up. So the capital infusion has worked with directly targeted measures which services these three important elements, which is consumption, savings and loans. You serviced your loans, you consumed, as well as you put some money away. And so there was a fairly even distribution within the realms with when the earnings was impacted, right? That is the government programs that has helped. The government with 0% absorbed the $2.2 trillion into its balance sheet, and it is servicing its balance sheet at a rate which is much lower relative to what it was prior to pandemic. Prior to pandemic, it was around 3% of the GDP was the interest cost. With 0%, which was on the threshold somewhere last year, which is 2019, when the interest rate went up to 2.2% to 2.25% and very quickly dipped to 0% or 0.25%, the cost of servicing the debt that it has absorbed came down to 1.2% of GDP in US. So which means the government also could afford to run its books without putting this 2.2 trillion cost as a burden into the full spectrum of the ecosystem, which is consumers, small businesses, mid to large corporates. So uh, if I understand you correctly, sir, uh, there was a bit of smart maneuvering that was done on part of Steve Mnuchin to make sure that the impact of a, an economy being switched off, completely switched off, is being felt as less as possible at the consumer side. That's how I understand it. Yeah. And uh, thank you, sir. And, and this is um, you know, there, there are two things that I see again. I mean, I, I'm just a, I'm a layperson, a banking enthusiast, an economics enthusiast. There are two things I'm seeing. If there is uh, no stimulus deal in the next eight weeks or six weeks or whatever, some timeline, I think U.S. also might start feeling some pinch because 
people have been buying this is christmas season people are buying i mean if you look at uh, amazon sales it's just going through the roof like no end so so there there is this is like this uh, proverbial you know cartoon character where the cartoon keeps running and running and running and then it runs off of the cliff but it goes pa- horizontal for some time and then it starts you know falling down there is going to be some hysteresis effects of this in the united states if another stimulus bill is not passed i think but more importantly in india i think there is a bigger problem and i think that is what i am concerned about because as middle class keeps digging into their savings and then you tell middle class well you happen to have an account in x bank and that bank is running low and you can only draw so much money at what point this drawal withdrawal you may have savings but you cannot withdraw money at what point that starts pinching we'll have to see with those words sir thank you very much uh, sridhar ji if you want to add something to it i was just trying to summarize what we were talking about in terms of real effect for the customer now i just was trying to you know it's, it's a fantastic summary ji uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here to to, to share what little i can share you know by way of from my experiences i just want to conclude by saying the two questions that you have un- that you have asked which we will probably cover tomorrow morning in our daily uh, daily show Uh, is that it looks like there will be a deal between uh, McConnell and thing it may not be 900 but it will be uh, enough to kind of uh, address the questions that you are raising i think on the indian side i just uh, the breaking news was or it probably happened few hours ago is that the finance minister has said the next stimulus will be uh, a growth oriented one that means you know she is trying to put more money that's my assumption i don't know the details but there seems to be snippets of answers to the questions that you are raising which is to say you know what's india going to do and what is united states going to do thank you uh, sridhar ji and viewers will be back first thing in the morning tomorrow to share with you the happenings in the us elections there's uh, more dramatic events going on and also covid updates there's some news about uh, pfizer so uh, we will with all that we will see you again very very shortly in about 12 hours time thanks once again sridhar ji and namaskar namaskar thank you everybody 